Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. See a few people still coming in. Anyway, this um, thank you for joining our webinar today. I'm trying to do the best I can to talk. I'm Glennis McClure, Extension Educator and Farm and Ranch Management Analyst with the Center for Ag Profitability at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Remember to find an archive of our past webinars, as well as a schedule of upcoming webinars in our Thursday series on our website at cap.unl.edu. As farmers and ranchers prepare to close out another tax year, there are many considerations to keep in mind ahead of filing. Today's webinar will cover many of those tax considerations, including crop insurance, deferral options for livestock sales, potential law changes, and more. To present, we're glad to have Tina Barrett, Director of Nebraska Farm Business Incorporated, um, um, with us today. And uh, Nebraska Farm Business started in 1976 as part of Nebraska Extension. And I can relate because I worked back with them back in the day. Today, they work with the hundreds of farmers and ranchers across the state providing financial consulting services, including financial analysis, business planning, tax preparation, and more. We're really, really grateful to have Tina joining us today as they are, I think, some of the premier folks um, in dealing with farm taxes. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn that over to Tina. Good, thanks, Glennis. All right, so uh, we're going to uh, get this going here. Let me get my, I always think it's gonna work. So Glennis, as Glennis mentioned, uh, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that everyone was familiar with what we do and, and why they asked me to talk about this. But like I said, we work with uh, producers all across the state in a wide variety of, of their financial um, majors and, and um, needs. Uh, but certainly this time of year, we have turned the page to tax planning and, and that's what we're, we're spending a lot of our time uh, doing right now. So um, today, she gave me a good thing, but I just want to go through what we're going to do. We're going to talk about some of the new tax laws, and the feds were actually really um, nice to us this year, didn't give us too much uh, change, but the state of Nebraska made some changes, and so we'll talk about those. And then we are going to talk about some of the things that are expiring, just because, um, we'll, yeah, we'll get to that, but there's several things that are on the horizon that we need to be paying attention to, and then we'll get into those um crop and livestock disaster provisions. And, and hopefully we have time just to do a few general tax planning thought processes. So well, let's jump into what uh, the state of Nebraska did. And really this isn't unique to Nebraska. They're actually uh, a little bit late to the game, but they uh, passed this year a pass-through entity tax election, um, which is a lot, of, um, a lot of E's and a lot of T's because we call it the P-T-E-T-E. -E. So um, yeah, lots of... Well, certainly a fun acronym, but what, what this does is this is, so we got to go back in time a little bit to understand this one. So um, in 2018, the feds passed the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Part of that law was um, one of the ways they paid for things or Hey, Tina, if you can hear me, we seem to have lost your audio. Even though it says you're not muted. How about that? Does that work? Yep. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. So when did you lose me? I would go uh, back to the first part of this, um, this slide, Tina. Sorry. Okay, sorry. Yep. Yep. Uh, thanks for stopping me on that one. Um, okay, so pass through entity tax election. This is um, one of the things that the state of Nebraska passed this year. So um, we, we, to get through this one, we got to back up in, in history a little bit. So um, in 2018, the feds passed the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. That allowed, uh, or one of the ways that they paid for some of the savings that they passed in that was to limit the amount of deduction that you could take on your itemized deductions for state and local tax. They call it the SALT deduction. Um, and so any return was limited to $10,000 was all you could deduct. So 
especially the high income tax states um, got on this very quickly to find a way to work around that. And that's what this is. And so Nebraska was um, actually one of the, the last states to pass it that has a state income tax. Um, but, um, but we have it now. So what it allows you to do is to have S Corps, it's for S Corps and partnerships. And it says that they can pay the state income tax for their owners. And then that becomes a business deduction, just like if it was a C Corp paying that state income tax, they get to deduct that as a business expense. Now partnerships and S Corps can do the same thing. Um, and so this is a whole different kind of thought process for, uh, for those owners who have, you know, those entities typically are not tax paying entities. Um, but uh, this is how it works around. So let's go through a couple of the details here. All right, so um, the the way this this and this is it said it's passed through entity tax deduction. We call it the PTET. Um, and so what we allow it allows you to do is take that uh, federal tax deduction for the state income tax in the year that that tax is paid. Okay, so it doesn't. At first, we thought we were going to have to go back and amend a bunch of returns, and and that's not the way it works. As cash basis taxpayers, you get the deduction when you pay it. Okay, and then. So the entity pays that tax and deducts it, and then uh, you get that back as a state credit on your K-1. Okay, so from the state standpoint, the entity pays it and the owners get it back. So it's just kind of a filter almost that allows us to deduct it for federal purposes. Um, one of the cool things about this is if there are out-of-state owners whose only Nebraska income is from an electing entity, okay, they no longer have to file a Nebraska tax return. And so that that could actually be a pretty significant savings. You know, anytime, you know, you're going to a tax repair and you're, you're adding states, um, there's always an additional cost to that. Um, and so just, the, just that filing requirement is very nice and to not have to do that. And so for those of you that are familiar, if you've got out-of-state owners who have had to file or fill out the 12Ns every year, you also wouldn't have to do that if you elect to do the PTET. Um, so again, just a couple of things that, that are, are just nice things, but uh, not the, necessarily the game changer in that. So um, so yeah, just question quick was, does the PTET pertain to LLC? So the from IRS's standpoint, an LLC is a disregarded entity. So they don't recognize an LLC as an entity. So when you are an LLC, you choose how you're going to be taxed. If it's a single member LLC, you're going to be taxed on a Schedule C or a Schedule F. And so no PTET for that. But if you've if you're taxed as a partnership or you're taxed as an S Corp, then yes. If you're an LLC that chooses to be taxed as a C Corp, no. So it's it's really just a matter of how you're taxed. And um so it, it just goes to that um uh, that level. So um one of the things that's a little different for farmers with this one is that in 24, so up until 20 this year, you they waived the estimated tax penalty. But because the entity does not uh, receive the same benefits as a qualified farmer does, um, if the entity is going to continue to do this, the entity is going to have to make estimated tax payments. And again, that's normal for everybody outside of farming to make quarterly estimated tax payments, but it is something new and different that's not um something that that we deal with a lot in the farming world. So um, uh, that is something that we have to pay attention to. All right. Um, I, I'm going to get through a couple more things and we'll look at an example here. But uh, Nebraska and Colorado were the only two states that allowed this election to be made retroactive back to 2018. So that's kind of being late to the game and getting it, but they've fixed it so that we can go back and get that benefit. Um, so uh, basically owners of an S Corp or, or a partnership are going to have um, several decisions to make um, here in the next little bit. This retroactive piece for the 2018 to 2022 years has to be made by December 31st, 25. So we've got some time on this one if you want. Um, you can make it multiple times. So you, like I said, in, you could do a couple years this year and you could do a couple years um, next year. And that's fine. Um, one thing um, 
that we're looking at that you might reason to do that is it, it this could create a little bit of a cash flow crunch because in order to do this, the entity is going to pay in the tax today that really the owners have already paid into the state. And then the state's going to give that money back. Okay. So you doesn't end up costing you anything, but there could be cash flow timing on that on when you get that. So you're going to get the deduction in the year that you pay it. And then you're not going to get that credit back until you file that tax return. So there could be a time gap in between that. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, one other thing that you might have to do is back in 2018, Nebraska did not require um, entities who were owned uh, by all owners of that lived in Nebraska, all Nebraska residents to file a tax return. So in order to claim this PTET deduction for um, the 2018 year, Nebraska needs a tax return filed. So uh, you did, there's no tax due with it. It's just um, you know, for at least for our, in our system, it's a pretty easy check the box, file in Nebraska, print it off. It has to be mailed in. We can't e-file those anymore. Um, but that way they have an idea of what that tax was. So again, lots of little things that are going to have to happen in here. Okay. So let's, let's look at an example and then maybe it'll, uh, it'll make a little bit of sense here. So each year is a separate election. So I just threw some numbers up here. Um, you know, some different variances of income. Um, but what we would do is pay in that tax. And so I went ahead and went put 23 and 24 on there. But if we're going to do the 2018 to 2022 election, you would add up the tax owed for those years, pay that in. And then on the next, on that K-1 for whatever year that that tax was paid, you're going to get that credit back. But in the meantime, we're gonna get a federal tax deduction for it. So I put in there with, if you were in the 22% tax bracket, what that federal tax savings would be. So over the seven years of potential right that we've got open right now, if you paid in about 84,000 of tax, you would get a federal tax savings of about 18,000. So it's not, depending on your level of income, it could be huge. Um, but it may not be that big of a deal. So we're kind of in our office playing with a threshold of if they've owed, if the tax owed would be about 2,500 over those past five years, it's probably worth the paperwork to go ahead and file the election and get that federal tax deduction. Um, obviously that savings is gonna depend on your tax bracket. If you're in the 37% tax bracket, then your savings is gonna be a lot higher you know, if your tax bracket's 10%, it's going to be a lot lower. Okay. Um, again, the state is not going to make any adjustment to this. So you get a federal tax deduction for this payment, but they're going to add that back to the state. So the state is a is a no change. So, so we've been trying to figure out how to do this uh, the most, um, the, with the quickest turnaround. And so the, to me, the, the fastest way that you can get your money back is that if you pay in your 2018 to 2022 tax and potentially even your 23 tax in December, that's going to show up on your K-1 that's going to be in March and you're going to get that money back right away. If you wait until March when you file the tax return to pay that tax, which is fine and you won't have a penalty this year if you do that, then you won't get that money back until May or March of 2025 when you file the 24 tax return. Okay. So the state will have your money for a full year, where if you go ahead and pay it in December, they're only going to have that money for a couple of months. Okay. And sometimes, you know, depending again on your profitability, the amount of that check that you're going to have to write is a fairly significant check. So, um, you know, if cash flow is a problem, you can think about doing maybe 18, 19, and 23 this year and then do 20, 21, 22, and 24 next year. You, you can play with those and of how we're gonna do that. But, but if you're gonna make this election, it is an annual election. So going forward, you can make a different choice for 24 than you make for 25 and you make for 26. But starting in 24, if you don't pay estimated tax um, deposits quarterly, then there will be a penalty for not having that paid in if you make that election late. So um going forward they're going to get their money uh quarterly and um there's really nothing we can do as, as far as that game to be played so let me see here 
Yeah. So I think, and maybe um, I answer that, but again, I'll just clarify the question was, will 12N still be required if an elected entity? So no, we won't have to, I don't, my understanding at least in, is that the 12Ns would not be required if, it, if the entity elects. And so that's a, a nice little, um, uh, it's paperwork savings is really all that is. So um, certainly a, a, a nice thing for that. So um, again, make sure you talk with your tax preparer about this. This is relatively new. We just got um, the forms and, and the instructions and stuff released for this, I believe in late September, maybe even October. So this is still relatively new thing. Um, and so it, it might be something that uh, your tax preparer might be ready to talk about 23 and making that election but the 18 to 22 election may be something they're gonna think about um, over the summer or this time next year. Like I said, you have until December 31st of 25 to make that election. So um, you got a little bit of time on that. Um, and you know, I'm, what I'm finding in early, early tax planning is some of these, I'm definitely doing that December estimate for 23. Um, and some, if it's just gonna be $1,000, I might go ahead and just wait until the tax returns filed and would not worry about an estimate. Uh, so it really just depends on, on the level of income and, and that sort of thing. But this is a, a nice little um, thing that, that we can get an extra deduction. Really, it's not gonna cost us anything. And really, uh, at the end of the day, it's a way to get more money out of that entity because the entity is taking on the responsibility of this tax liability um, and passing that on to you. And, and you're the one benefiting from that. So. Um, kind of a nice little thing. It's certainly something we'll figure out. Like I said, several states have been doing this um, for a while now. So I've got colleagues in Illinois that have been using this sort of um, deduction since 19. And really they feel like there's the only times that it doesn't make sense to make this election is if the entity doesn't make any money, uh, there wouldn't be any reason to make the election. If uh, the owners change, because the current owners are going to get the credit, even if some of the previous owners um, paid the tax. So there could be an issue there. Um, and then the other thing that they're finding is there are just some uh, farmers who are just really adverse to paying those quarterly estimated tax payments, and they don't want to do it regardless of how much it might save them. So that's pretty much their only three times that they're not making this election on um on these returns and they've got a couple of years of experience. So it's kind of nice that they uh, were able to figure this out for us. So, all right, a couple other things that the state did. Um, I just want to point out, just make sure people are uh, aware. I thought that was a static picture. I didn't know that was a video. So, um, but uh, they did an Opportunity Scholarship Act and you're going to hear, this is something that they, you're certainly hearing about in the news and it's going to be on the ballot as far as uh, letting the voters decide if they're going to continue with this or not. But it is in 24, and if you do take advantage of this, they're going to honor that credit, even if in November that gets repealed. Um, and so it's kind of an interesting thing, but it, what it does is allows, if you contribute to a scholarship granting organization, and those scholarship granting organizations are there to provide needs-based scholarships for private elementary and secondary schools in Nebraska, um, then the state will give you a credit that is up to how much you gave to those organizations or 50% of your tax liability or $100,000, okay? So um, again, if you're interested in that, I'm guessing the, uh, the private school that you're interested in helping will have better information, um, but certainly something that's interesting and new to Nebraska. So wanted to point that out. And then the other thing is they worked on changing the tax rates. So we do have a tax uh, cut this year for the rates. It has been 6.84% as pretty, I think as long as I've done taxes, which is getting to be a while now. So in 23, that top rate has dropped to 6.64%. Um, next year it will be six or 5.84. The next year it will be 5.2 and then we'll move to only three brackets. Um, and by 2027, the top rate will be down to 3.99. So did get a little bit of um, relief from the state on, on tax rates as well. So um, really almost got close to uh, a 50% cut by the time we're done with that 2027. So I don't think we're going to feel the 0.2% change um, a whole lot this year. 
but uh, but that's going to continue to work down. So, all right. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about some of the things that are on the Fed side. Um, and again, no changes, but uh, somehow that Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 18, when it was passed, 2026 seemed like a long ways away. Um, and now we're starting to see it's it's coming it's coming closer than we think. So I went back and I pulled um, just some historic tax rates because I think one of the things as you're thinking about tax planning this year and next year and maybe even 25 to keep in mind is that these tax rates we have right now are historically some of the lowest we've had. So um, 1981 was was probably the highest where we had a 70% tax rate um, on incomes over 215,000. I indexed that to 22, so that was like 706,000. So that's that's a, it was a lot of money back then, but still 70% rate was a lot. 86 that got dropped to 50,000, or I'm sorry, 50% on incomes that would be similar to a to 475,000 last year. And then last year, that top, or in 2017, that top rate was 39.6, so certainly better. And the 2017 is really important because the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act put the lower rates in, but it sunsets in 2025. So in 2026, our rates are going to look very similar to 2017 if Congress doesn't do anything to extend or change it at that point. But there will there will be, without action, a uh, a retro back to the 2017 schedules. Um, and so you can see that top rate uh, will be kicking in about 570,000 of income instead of the 630. Um, so those brackets not only got um, lower from a percentage standpoint, but they got widened. And maybe if you even look um, that 25% tax bracket, um, you know, would go up to that 153 back in 17. And now it's a 22% going up to 172, that 28 going up to 233, the 20, which is now 24 going up to 320 or 330. So even um, at those lower rates, you might go from paying 24 per, from paying like a 22% tax to paying 28% in 26. So again, I, I think it's really important that we pay attention to those and and maximize use of those brackets over the next couple of years because. Um, you know, we just don't know if we're going to have um, those back um, or not. The other thing that's sunsetting is the 199A deduction. And we spent a lot of time in 2018 and 2019 figuring this out. Um, and we've invested so much in it. I hate to see it go away for two reasons. One, because it's really beneficial. And two, because we spent a lot of time on it. But um what it does essentially is give you 20% of your qualified income that's excluded from income. So, so you take your schedule F of $100,000 uh, of net profit and 20,000 comes off of it and you only pay tax on 80, okay? So it's a really nice little tax deduction that um, you know, we, we just, it happens and you just don't see it. Um, right now, if your income is over 364,000 for a married filing joint, then, um, there is some limits to that where we have to apply some thresholds with um, either how many wages you pay or what your investment is um, that can sometimes get us around that threshold, but um, but certainly a, a significant deduction. So I just ran some numbers for you just so you could see that. So if I've got, again, farm income of 100,000 in 2017 or 26, 26, about the same, right? Versus what we have today, it's a it's about almost a doubling of the tax at that rate. So it will go from paying about six thousand today to paying about twelve thousand and twenty six. So again, it's going to be significant. And I I've seen the numbers of what they're doing to project as to what that Q, what it would take to expend the the QBI is one ninety nine a, um, and it's in the trillions of dollars. So it's going to take um, significant participation from. Um, everyone in Congress in order to, to to make that continue to go on or significant cuts somewhere, but it is it is significant. And this isn't just the QBI, because obviously things like um, the standard deduction was doubled in that it'll go back to that half rate. We'll bring back personal exemptions, which we don't have today. Lots of things that will change, but um, but we certainly won't have as good of a tax uh, break as we've got now. So. Yeah, so, okay. 
All right. So the other things I'm going to just, again, bring to your attention about what's expiring. We know we've got that federal estate tax exclusion that was out there that um, it's currently at um, about 13 million this year, will be at like 13.6 million next year. And essentially, again, that's one of those things where that previous law is kind of underneath where they put this up. So it's still indexing for inflation underneath this one, but it should be about half of that in 2016 because it'll be based off of a $5 million index for inflation number instead of a $10 million index for inflation number. So um, just uh, just pay attention to that. Again, uh, who knows what's going to happen with, with that one, um, but, um, but significant change. And then I mentioned that that standard deduction will probably also be cut in half, but we will get the personal exemptions back to offset some of that. And then the child tax credit will also be a uh, thousand instead of two thousand. So uh, lots of changes that the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act did a lot of things, and so a lot of those are just automatically going away. So okay. And then the other question we get as far as a uh, as what's happening there is the one seventy nine and bonus, and so um, that one is um, that the one seventy nine election rate or the limit raised up was permanent. Okay, so that means it's it's there until they act to change it. Where the uh, 199A sunsets, it goes away if they don't do anything. So it, it's a kind of the two, they call it permanent, but we all know it's just until they change it the next time. Um, so the limits for 2023, we have 1.6, or sorry, 1.16 million is how much we can expense in 23, as long as you don't purchase more than $2.89 million worth of assets. Okay, so... Uh, we've got that. But the big change for depreciation is bonus is going to 80%. So it's been 100% since 18. Um, and so it was, again, part of this, it was part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. It was meant to, to sunset and go away and phase out. So this is the first year that we have that phase out. So bonus is only 80%. The next year it'll be 60, then it'll be 40, and then it'll be gone, or 20 and then gone. So it, it's set to go away. Again, there's been discussion um, in Washington about that being extended, but, um, you know, I think, uh, we've got bigger issue or different issues that they're working on now instead of, um, extending any of this tax law stuff. So it doesn't look like any of that's probably going to happen unless it gets slipped into a bill that, um, doesn't, it doesn't otherwise apply. Um, the one thing that's come up this year, uh, with the reduction in bonus is, um, we've got for larger operations who are doing a lot of equipment trading, um, we could get easily get to the point where we have a, an actual issue in how this is going to be treated. Um, so I, I put together an example and just, um, again, we're, we're seeing these on the larger operations who are taking advantage of the dealers, uh, multi-unit discounts or, you know, they're bundling, however you want to terminology or terminology or call it, whatever they call it when they were looking at rolling a significant amount of their equipment every year. So this was an example. They were going to um, lock in at, after the first year, they were pretty much rolling their entire line of equipment every year for a $385,000 trade difference, uh, which wasn't too bad. Um, the first year there was a little bit more because not everything was up to uh, the one year standard. Um, so I worked through this example. So let me just walk you through how this might go. So that first year, they're going to have um, the trade-in value has to be sold. They have no basis because they've written everything off in the past. So they have a gain of 5.4 million from that sale of the, of the old assets. Then they bought $7 million worth of assets, but they can only take a 60% bonus. So I, I we were working out a year. So uh, this is for 24. So they can only take 60% bonus. Regular depreciation comes in after that, but they can only depreciate 4.76 million in that first year. That means they have a gain to recognize on their tax return of $640,000. Okay. Then as we fall into the normal, but we drop bonus to 40%, we're going to have that trade in of 6.6 .6 million. They're going to have a little basis because they couldn't deduct it all last year, right? So we, now our gain is only four point three million, but we still have seven million dollars worth of purchases. Bonus drops down to two point eight, increases regular a little bit, 
but now they've got a $735,000 gain. And that's going to continue every year until things kind of settle out. And actually, once bonus goes away, it'll all work out because we've got remaining value then to reduce the gain and they'll have enough depreciation to offset that. But the transition from being used to expensing everything in the year that you purchase it to uh, transitioning to not being able to use that um, is a significant. And again, they can't use 179 in this case because they have far exceeded the $3 million purchase limit. Um, even though they only spent 1.6 or 385,000, what we're looking at now is a purchase of 700 or $7 million worth of equipment. So again, it, this may not apply to you, but if you're at all looking at trading a combine and a couple of tractors and a sprayer, you know, we're getting to 3 million in a real hurry. So it doesn't even have to be your entire line of equipment. Um, but the with the price of equipment being what it is, that $3 million limit is becoming real for a lot of producers. And we don't have bonus to fall back on like we've had since 2018. So really pay attention if you're spending that much in equipment, because it, it could be a shock here for a while. Um, one of the things that's coming up as a result of these conversations is leasing equipment again instead of um, instead of purchasing. So I wanted to go through what IRS considers to be a lease because that's very different usually than what um, uh, we consider to be a lease or certainly what the equipment dealers are, are considering to be a lease. So IRS's definition is that it, it, a lease has a fair market value buyout at the end of the time. So it can't be a dollar buyout and it can't be a final payment as a buyout. Um, and we don't see the dollar buyouts any as much anymore as we did 15 years ago, but we still see where that final payment is the buyout of the lease. And IRS says that's not a lease. That's a that's just a disguised purchase. Okay. Um, and the other thing that's even uh, a little bit more of a smoking gun is that the IRS says there shouldn't be an interest rate tied to the agreement on a lease. And a lot of those leases that I, at least I'm seeing come through um, is a lease at this interest rate. Well, so it's not a lease, it's just a purchase. Um, and so we've got to be careful of that. And we have a lot of um, salesmen and a lot of dealers who will say, oh no, our leases are leases. But if you look in their detail of their lease agreement, it'll even say in there that that they don't provide tax advice and, and won't um, say that that is in fact a, a true lease. So just be careful if you make that choice um, there are, you know, some ways that that leasing will work and, and is true. Just make sure that those those agreements are are um, within the IRS's definition of a lease, because, again, now we don't have the fallback of having that depreciation. So if we go through audit and they say, no, nope, this lease is a purchase instead of being able to deduct that payment. Now we're looking at depreciation gain on the sale. Uh, all of those things. The other thing about a lease that doesn't look like a lease is when they take trade in on a lease, right? So that doesn't, um, if you think about really renting a piece of equipment, they're not going to take a um, down payment or a um, take dollars off of that by you giving them your old one. So um, anyway, that just think, that, make sure it looks like a lease. All right. And then, okay, so while we're talking about making sure things look right, we're going to talk about prepaid expenses here in just a second. So uh, again, uh, IRS's rules are pretty specific on what prepaid expenses are allowed. Um, you can only prepay up to 50% of your usual business expense. So that doesn't mean you can only prepay 50% of your fertilizer, but so that looks at your total Schedule F expenses. So if you're normally spending a million dollars, then you can prepay a half a million, Okay. Uh, it has to be an actual purchase. So this is where I, I always hate to see a, a check in December written for $20,000 because the chances of that being a specific quantity of an asset of an item at a specific price is pretty slim. Sometimes it works out, um, but you want to buy a, you know 20,000 gallons of diesel at X price and that's your prepay. You can't just give the co-op a $20,000 check and say, we'll use it for whatever I spend it on next year. Uh, IRS does not say that's a, a, a valid prepaid. So make sure you have an invoice. And they've been um, a little bit more picky about that on audit and making sure that they want to look at those things and see those invoices and make sure that they're they're uh, real prepaids. 
you also have to have a management reason for prepay and that reason can't be tax avoidance. So you can't use prepays to um, so distort your income or avoid tax. But uh, there's lots of reasons that we prepay. You know, a, a discount would be a, a good management reason as to why you're prepaying. You could have um, fear that that fertilizer is not going to be available in March, so we're guaranteeing it. Um, or you think the fuel prices are going up, so we're going to lock that in. So we can always come up with a management reason for that. It's usually when we get a little bit um, creative in our prepays, where we're maybe approaching that 50% rule as well. Uh, you know, something like prepaying your insurance expense. I, I don't know what the management reason for that would be. It's if the it's going to be the same price today as it's going to be in April. Uh, what's the point of paying it early? So just watch that and be careful. Also need to uh, remember that you can't be dealer financed. Most of the large companies um, have that figured out. That's why we have JD Financial or um, Pioneer Financial or any of those other companies. That's They've set up a separate company so that it's not dealer financed. But sometimes our smaller um, dealers, uh, you know, maybe a feed dealer uh, or something like that would take that money and call it a prepay. If it's the same, if it's going in the same pocket, that's not a prepay. Uh, because there isn't a, a legal obligation there. So um, just be, again, aware of that most of the companies have that problem figured out. And then we, are, we were just talking again before we got on today about interest rates because it's becoming a significantly different thing. So I did throw through up here some, just some, just as an eye opener as to what the carry costs are on um, these prepaids now. So if you're going to prepay $100,000 and you're paying it six months early, that's that, and your interest rates up to 10% on your operating note, um, you know, that's a $5,000 expense there um, that will make a nice tax deduction next year. But, um, you know, again, from a management standpoint, um, might not might not save that much in taxes. So make sure you're, very, you're thinking about that because it's just something we haven't had to think about for so long as interest rates have been nice and low. So, okay, I'm going to go on and uh, talk about crop insurance here. It seems like every year we think this is the the biggest uh, disaster year, and then, then we get another. So certainly going to have a lot of insurance claims out there. So let's just talk um, about um, that one here a little bit. Um, so crop insurance is pretty simple. You have to be a cash basis taxpayer to do this. So if you're a accrual basis taxpayer, which there's not very many out there, um, you cannot um, do a, a deferral. You have to usually sell more than 50% of your affected crops in the year following production, All right? So it has to be your normal business practice to defer. Um, again, also isn't too much of a problem. The, um, there isn't a need for a, a, a county disaster de declaration or anything like that. Um, it is an all or none election. And so even if you normally sell your beans in the year of production and hold your corn over, uh, as long as that's more than 50% of your total crops, we have to defer all of it. So if you got corn and beans crop insurance, you have to decide if you're going to defer all of it or none of it. The only exception to that is um, revenue-based insurance. Okay, so when the crop insurance tax law was written, uh, revenue insurance was not on the radar. and But the way that the law is written is that you can defer crop insurance due to crop damage to the year following, okay? But we have, and this is going to be one of those years where we're going to have part of that crop insurance payment is due to revenue-based. In a lot of ways, it gives us a little bit of flexibility because then we have the right to say, okay, this much of the crop insurance we can't defer because it's based off of revenue. Um, and this much is based off of crop destruction, that much we can defer. Okay, so it gives it a little bit of flexibility, especially in these large claims where you know, you're getting a whole lot of money or a large, a significant percentage of your crop uh, value in that one or two checks. Um, we've got to pay attention to that. So the uh, easiest thing that you I usually do is ask the crop insurance agent to help us figure out how much of that is revenue based? How much of it is is um, price is destruction production based? Um, so that we can have that split and and keep that on file. The other misconception I get a lot with uh, crop insurance deferrals is that you can go either way, but that only it works if you 
get the check in December. If you get the check in January, it's taxable next year. You can't pull it back. Okay. All right. So let's go through livestock quick that um, we're going to, so we don't run out of time here. Let me get a few more. So uh, livestock has two options. There's a one-year deferral for all livestock and a four-year deferral for draft dairy and breeding livestock. Again, you have to be a cash basis taxpayer. I don't know why it's not advancing here. There it goes. Um, but And you may need a county disaster declaration. And again, not a problem this year um, for all counties uh, except one. But uh, let me go through the difference between this one-year deferral and the two. When I meant to take out all these animations. Okay, so... The one-year deferral allows, again, that excess livestock to, that you sold. So you, if you sold your calf crop in January of 23 from last year, and then this year just didn't have the, the ability to carry that calf crop any longer than weaning, so you sold them in October, you've got two calf crops in one year. We can do some calculations to figure out, <clears throat> excuse me, how much of that was extra, and we can defer that to the next year. Um, we have to prove that that was the sale was caused by drought. For that one, we don't need the federal da uh, disaster declaration. You know, if they released emergency roadside hain or CRP in your county, stuff like that counts. The four-year deferral um, starts as a two-year deferral, and then it goes to four years if um, the drought extends. Okay, so. But what that allows you to do is take that gain on the sale of those animals and reduce the purchase price of the replacement ones. And so it it doesn't um, really hit your tax return. If after four years of drought, it's not feasible to replace with like kind. So right now, you if you have sold beef cows, you have to replace them with beef cows. You can't even go into like dairy cows with them. Um, after four years, then you can go into non-like kind property and even buy a tractor. Can't Still can't do land, but you could do it. You could replace them with a tractor or a building or something like that. Um, the four year deferral, like I said, is based off of the National Drought Mitigation Center, which of course we host at UNL. Um, but it counts your county and those surrounding yours. So if one of those are declared, so I pulled the drought map or the uh, disaster declaration map, that's for the uh the whole uh, country. Um, but in Nebraska, it is 88 counties that were declared disasters and there are four continuous counties. So every county but Richardson this year is eligible for these livestock deferrals. Okay. And if in Richardson County, there were some other things that you could prove that there was in fact a drought and you needed to sell, the one year deferral still counts. But everybody else is covered for any of the deferrals that you want to make. Um, again, everything has to be done by the due date of your tax return. Um, and, um, yeah, so just some, some details on that. One thing to think about that is just because you can defer, it doesn't mean that's the best thing you can do. Um, especially if you've got raised breeding livestock, you may be looking at a 0% capital gains tax by just recognizing it, or even a 15% capital gains tax. And then when you buy those animals back, you get a 12% income tax and a 15% self-employment tax savings. So you might be better off to not make the election. So it's certainly something to consider. All right. Let's go through here. All right. So I, I did some math again, just looking at um, doing that. But if you recognize the income, it, it, and again, it works best with raised breeding livestock um, that you might actually end up saving 6,000 by not de deferring that income, okay, over the long haul. So again, just make sure you work with your tax preparer on that. Um, it doesn't work as good with um, the purchase breeding livestock, but still put maybe even a savings of $1,000 there on that $7,000 gain. So um, certainly something to consider. Um, the other thing, again, with that deferral, maybe don't do the deferral, prepay some expenses, do some income averaging, do some other things that can do that 
couple of reasons. We got those future tax rates that look to be higher than what we've got today. And, um, you know, if we defer it and then can't replace them later on, we got to come back and amend this year's return, which could affect everything going forward. We wouldn't have the ability to do um, as much as far as like using section 179 or anything like that to offset it. So uh, sometimes it's better just to, to go with it. All right, I think I've got time to do a couple of these things and still have time for questions. So I always like to point out just a couple of different random strategies, nothing new or different about this, but paying your spouse is always um, something to think about. It allows us to potentially turn a health insurance deduction into a farm expense, which will reduce the self-employment taxes. It doesn't save you anything from income tax or FICA tax just to pay the wage because we move it from Schedule F to, the, to a W-2. So it doesn't change anything like that. But if we can get some of your health costs um, to be created as a Schedule F expense, then we can save some money. Part of that, again, depends on where you're at. So if you're below the SE limit, we can save some significant amounts. But if you're above the Social Security limit, you know it, it's only a couple hundred dollars, so it might not be worth the paperwork. Um, this can also get thrown off if you have empl other employees that you would need to offer health insurance to, um, and you don't want to do that. Um, so things to certainly discuss with your uh, tax preparer about your individual situation. The other benefit to paying a spouse is to make sure, especially if that spouse is not working off the farm, they're not building the social security history. And so um, by you paying them, they're going to build that social security history. And we're not really worried about retirement benefits at that point. Um, but we do, there are other things that social security does like disability insurance, survivor benefits. So if something happened to that spouse and they had small children under the age of 18, they would qualify for um, payments, you know, until they turned 18 or they graduated from high school. And that could be a significant savings. So, um, so certainly again, something if you, especially if you have uh, both spouses working on the farm and, or uh, staying home with small children, something to think about. And speaking of children, um, we, uh, it's always important to think about sole proprietors being able to pay their children under the age of 18 without paying employment taxes. So this time now we actually are getting some some tax savings. And kids can have a 12,000, well, it's a $13,000 standard deduction now. So they can earn up to that and not pay any income taxes. So you get a deduction on your return. They're not paying any income taxes because it's under their standard deduction. And if they're under the age of 18, you don't have to pay the withhold the FICA taxes. So that's nice as well. Um, and the other things that that allows to do is the kid has earned income now, so they can put that money into a Roth IRA and start saving for the um, for many things because the Roth IRA account or could be used to pay for college education for themselves or their dependents. Could be used to, for a first time home purchase. Um, and the kind of cool thing is the FAFSA program doesn't look at IRAs as ability to pay, even though we can use a Roth. So if you've got the money saved in a 529 plan, FAST was going to say, okay, you can pay for the first, you know, however many dollars you've got saved up. But if you've got it saved at a Roth, FAFSA might come along and help you a lot um, with those um, college expenses as well. So while you still have the ability to, to pay what the extra. And then the last thing I was going to throw out was just commodity wages. Again, the social security limit is going up so high that um, this is something, again, that's starting to become maybe beneficial. It has to be done correctly, so you need to work with your tax preparer to make sure that you're dotting the I's and crossing the T's. Um, but it could potentially be a way that we could increase um, maybe wages paid out of an S-corp to an owner to a reasonable level without paying a lot of employment taxes. So um, again, it just, all it does is you get paid in grain or it, grain probably is what it should be rather than, um, being paid in cash and that, uh, exempts it from the FICA tax. So, all right. So if you've got questions, go ahead and put those in the chat and I'm happy to answer those as, as much time as we've got. I do see there is one that is asking about the slide deck and I will certainly send these over to Ryan and he can post those, um, however, or distribute them. I'm assuming he has those magic powers to do that. So, uh, but I will definitely get the slides to Ryan so that you can have those. Are there any other questions? I know that felt really fast. So I'm guessing I talked really fast and <laughs> dumped a lot of information in a short amount of time. So.
No, I'm Tina. It's good. I don't see any other questions right now. Um, let's look here. We'll just kind of give a minute. Commodity wages, someone's asking if you could touch on that. And there was an earlier question about if they didn't farm in 2017. And I don't know when that popped up exactly. But commodity wages, you want to say anything more about that again, Tina? Oh, goodness, I'm not seeing any questions pop up there. It's under the chat. Just says, could you touch on commodity wages again? Can you hear me? <laughs> okay, well, I can hear you, Glennis. I'm not sure. Maybe Tina lost Should audio. Maybe we lose you, Glennis. Um, so we'll see if I can get her in the chat. Hey, Tina, can you hear me? Yeah, she's not hearing us, I guess. Check. I just let her know in the chat. Maybe she'll come on here. Can you hear us now, Tina? Just having some audio issues. Okay. Oh, I can hear you again. Okay, there we go. There was someone, Tina, that was asking about touching on commodity wages again. Oh, what was the question? I, I didn't see that one. Commodity. Oh, touch wages. on commodity wages. Yeah. yeah so, it, like, okay, I can back up a little bit on commodity wages there. And so commodity wages, again, is just paying in commodity rather than cash. Um, it is still subject to unemployment. So we, we used to use them to get around unemployment and the state kind of closed that loophole. Um, but um, those wages, again, are not subject to employment taxes. What happens is they, so um, farmer gives their employee 10,000 bushels or let's say a thousand bushels of corn. And on that day, it was worth $5. So they're going to have a $5,000 W-2 and then the employee on their return, when they sell that, um, maybe they sell it for $5.10 a bushel. And so they'll have a $100 um, gain on that that they'll have to put on their Schedule D. So it's a little bit more work on their side, uh, which is a lot of times why we don't do it with un unrelated employees, but you can. Um, and you could just need to transfer the commodity to them, they should pay transportation and ownership costs from that day on. So if there's storage, uh, any of that, it should be paid by the employee. Um, and uh, like I said, it, it's a it's an option that's out there. It's it's not new, um, but we're starting to see some reasons why it might be beneficial just with the changing tax advice or changing tax environment. So. Hopefully that helps. Again, like I said, it can be pretty complicated. I probably could spend 20 minutes just on the ins and outs of that. Um, but uh, um, your, your tax preparer should be able to help you with some of those. Tina, there was an earlier question about if they didn't farm in 2017. I don't know when that popped in exactly. So um, yeah, I'm trying to think if that we were just talking. I I mean anything that we if you like so if it was on the PTET discussion, you know if you didn't farm or the entity wasn't in existence in 18 or 19, you just you can't make an election for those years. So that's you know it's fine. It doesn't change anything. You just uh, there's nothing to elect for those years. Um, and it kind of works the same way if there was an entity that was in existence in 18 and 19 and maybe closed it in 20, you can't go back and make that election for that entity because it's not in business today. So, um, right. yeah, I, I, that's probably a good point. Yeah. Okay. I don't see any other questions right now or in the chat. 
So I think we'll go ahead and finish out here. And we really appreciate um, you taking time with us, Tina, um, today. Always good information. But so I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. A recording of the webinar will be posted at cap.unl.edu along with the slides uh, where you can also register for upcoming webinars uh, that we'll have scheduled for now, you know, now until and up to the through the new year. And we'd really uh, appreciate your feedback now, too, always on our webinars. So there'll be a brief evaluation that'll pop up after you exit the Zoom. So if you can fill that out, it always helps us with information on how we can improve um, and inform us for future webinars. So again, thank you. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. And we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.